So good morning. Thank you. Uh, I also slept well. I stayed up for 30 hours while I traveled from Chicago yesterday, so uh, I, I, I slept well. Yeah, so I'm Naomi Cedar, and I want to talk about, I, I've called this What Lies Ahead, uh, some future strengths and challenges for the Python software community, for uh, Python the language. Um, I, as, as mentioned, um, uh, I am for at least two more days on the board of directors of the Python Software Foundation. The results from the election should be uh, figured out on, on Sunday. Then perhaps I won't be able to say that anymore. Who knows? Uh, I, I, I am pretty certain that come Monday, I still will be able to call myself the open source development manager uh, at Dick Blick Art Supplies. Uh, which is a job I've been at for about uh, six months. We are the United States' largest seller of artist supplies, paints, canvas, brushes, pencils. It's really fun, actually. Um, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, so a disclaimer, uh, this talk is a complete fabrication. Uh, it is a collection of my recollections and I'm at an age where I don't trust my memory much anymore, uh, uh, my opinions uh, and my speculations. So uh, please bear that in mind. Um, in fact, uh, the purpose of, of this talk, I hope, is to spark some, uh, some conversation. So I do invite you to uh, dispute absolutely everything I say. Uh, and um, I invite you to do that in person via Twitter, via email. Now, next week, whenever, you don't even have to argue with me. You can argue with other people who are involved. I am hoping that the topics that I raise, in other words, uh, will be things that um, will cause discussion. Maybe if it's not um, the issue that I raise that, that requires discussion, maybe it's the answer to that issue that requires discussion. But I must add, particularly if you are discussing in, uh, uh, via the internets, uh, please, please, let's try to do this politely and, and respectfully. Uh, I may well be completely wrong, but at least be nice about it. Uh, but I do want this to be very much uh, a, a conversation. Obviously, it doesn't work so much for, for a keynote for everybody to be talking now, but um, all day today, please feel free to, to come and tell me why you think I, something was, was whatever or your opinions. And as I say, what I hope is that this will cause discussions within the communities as we face some of these things. Or I suppose maybe all of these things that I raise will come to absolutely nothing at all, in which case we don't need to worry about it, but I rather doubt that. So I will tell you, there is one thing, there is one thing that you cannot dispute. This is the one fact that I'm sure about in this entire talk. I am, in fact, quite, quite old. All right, you may not believe me, but as I look out here, you guys get younger every year. Um, so, um, this is an audience participation part. It's my one real audience participation part. I would like, and I know it's the first thing in the morning, but bear with me. I would like you to raise your hand if you were using Python in 2016. I mean, I would hope we get most of the hands up, but if not, it's great if we have new. Okay, now, 2011. Keep your hands up if 2000, that's five years ago, okay? Uh, 2006, 10 years ago, okay, 2001, oh, there are a couple back there, a lot, yeah, yeah, there, all right, um, that, and, and I don't want to go back any further than that, uh, that that's probably uh, fine enough, uh, so there are maybe four or five of us in the room, something like that. So I started in 2001. Uh, I went to a Linux World Conference in the United States. This was back when uh, this Linux thing was, was still pretty new. Uh, but they had uh, in San Francisco, Linux World was about 12,000 people, I think, something like that. And it was really cool because it was before commercial interests really got into the Linux world big time. So it was, it was kind of a community-ish conference. Um, and uh, this guy, Guido Van Rossum, was giving a um, 
day-long tutorial in this language, Python, and that's, that's one of the things that I did. Um, and uh, it was a time when, in fact, Python 2.2 was just out. Uh, so I want to, for perspective's sake, talk a little bit about what things looked like then so that I can kind of compare them to what things look like now and, and perhaps what things may look like in the future. Uh, so, 2001, what was going on then? Um, there were, as, as you may remember, no smartphones. Um, I was carrying one of the little Nokia candy bar phones, uh, and you could try to teach it things. Um, you could uh, send a text to Google, and then you would get back like five texts of the top results. I don't know if anybody else remembered doing that. It was a very painful process. Um, we, we had moved on from having, I, we hadn't, in a lot of places we hadn't moved on yet, but we were in the process of moving on to fast internet, which was something on the order of uh, 512K. It seemed like a lot at the time. Um, I think it was about that time I got my first broadband connection, it was more like 300, but I was thrilled. It was the fastest thing in town, it was wonderful. Um, computers usually, if you were, most computers that we used uh, had a single processor. And um, that wasn't so much of a concern because in those days, at least the way I would put it is that Moore's Law was still working and, and processing power was still scaling uh, what I would call vertically. That is, it was the same processor that you know, a single processor was getting twice as fast, twice as good, about every 18 months. Uh, and this had been going on by that time for 10, 15 years, something like that. It was like, you know, when's, when's this gonna end? Well, I don't know. And every time there would be a think piece that, about how Moore's Law had to end, we could not keep scaling our, our, uh, our performance that way. Uh, about that time, you would turn the page in the magazine because, of course, we were still reading things on paper in those days. Remember paper? Uh, and uh, there would be an ad announcing Intel's latest processor, which was indeed about twice as good, powerful, more wonderful than the version they had announced 18 months ago. So those are some things to keep in mind. That's what was going on. It was... As I think about it, it was a very different world in all sorts of ways. And, you know, in Python was also a very different world. Uh, this, it's kind of hard to see, but that's Guido and, and uh, Steve Holden at the first PyCon that was a PyCon. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, talking about the state of the Python union. Um, so, as I say, Python 2 was new. Um, Python 152 had had a great run, but Python 2 was, was the way that things were going. There were new style classes, which were cool. Um, these days in Python 3, you know what we call new style classes? Classes. That's it. There's the, they, they are the way that things work. Um, we called ourselves Pythoneers then, but there weren't very many of them. In fact, I mean, I didn't know this at the time, because I was just going to my very first workshop, but that 2001, when I learned Python at Linux World, a conference of 12,000 open source Linux type people, the Python community such as it was, sent around an email wondering if they could get together maybe a dozen people to go have a beer. And I guess they made it, uh, but that, that was just about it. So that's, that's how rare we were. Uh, when I started doing Python, I was in the um, city of Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's about 200,000 people. And um, I was the only person, well, so I was working at a school and I was teaching my students Python. But other than that, there was nobody I knew of in any sort of reasonable distance around me that had ever heard of this thing. Um, as I say, we didn't have things called PyCon until 2003. If you go back and, and look at the history of Python conferences, 
There were in the very early days the spam workshops that, that they talked about. And if you haven't seen the panel discussion of the olden days uh, at the end uh, that was done during um, uh, PyCon this year, you should go look up the video. It's entertaining to watch. Uh, but those were really, the spam workshops were really a bunch of people in a room. It wasn't what, what I would think of as a conference. Uh, then for a while they did the IPC, the International Python Conference, which a commercial uh, conference company put on. And I really don't know what those were like because every time you talk to one of the old timers about it, they just go, oh yeah, IPC. And then they change the subject. So I don't know what that means. Uh, but the very first PyCon, as in a community conference, the model that this and, and so many around the world have done, uh, that did not happen until 2003, so even a, a couple years in the future from when I started. Um, and in fact, um, I was, my claim to fame, I, I do have one claim to fame, I've been to every single PyCon US, okay? I, I plan to keep that up until I die. Uh, and then um, another thing that was very different then from now is that one of the big things driving the Python ecosystem was Zope. How many people have heard of Zope? That's not so bad, actually. Uh, Zope is a web application, uh, a big, honking, imposing web application in a way. This isn't a framework. Uh, and um, it was sort of the way that people thought about doing web apps in Python at the time. Uh, and, and I, in fact, in 2002, for the school, I was director of technology, and I wrote a student information system. We tracked marks, we tracked the courses they were taking, etc., using Zope. It was probably one of the more difficult things I've ever done in my life because the documentation was really bad. You had this enormous web app thing that you had to configure. Um, but in fact, it ran from 2002 until 2016, and I left the school in 2011, so it was essentially unmaintained for the last five years of its, of its useful life. Uh, so uh, it, yeah, that's one of the longer-running Zope applications that I know of. Uh, so that's what was going on in, in Python. And, you know, we were, we were thinking about things. Uh, and here again, these, these are my recollections, my impressions. Um, it could well be that there were other things that were big deals to other people in the Python community that I was not aware of. But the things that I recall being talked about or being the things like, what's up with Python, etc., Prejudice against the use of indentation used to be a big deal. I can remember these discussions going on. Oh, I could never use Python. You format your code using indentation. Okay. Um, but remember, this was, this was the age where if you were on a C programming mailing list, you could count on about every two months getting into a big flame war over how many spaces you were to indent your code and whether the curly braces were, where the curly braces were supposed to go. Um, in the C world, by the way, I was a two-space indenter, and I liked to put my curly braces on separate lines. That meant that I was pretty much unacceptable for people to talk to because nobody liked to do that. Um, so, um, but yes, it was a big deal that, that Python was formatted with indentation. I haven't heard that argument seriously used in years, but it used to come up all the time. Uh, you, you, you would try to persuade a Java programmer to try Python, and they say, no, it uses indentation. Huh? Uh, so that was a big deal. <sighs> Similarly, we used to worry a lot more about Perl. Uh, I, I honestly haven't had to use Perl jokes in a long time, uh, but at the time, uh, and, and Guido mentions this, Larry Wall, the creator of Perl, publicly went on record as sort of this kind of huffy, oh, I'm not worried at all about Python. Uh, so, um, that was, that was something that was going on. It was, for almost anything you got, if you were going to do some sort of system maintenance type stuff, Perl was the language on your Linux box, okay? In fact, Python wasn't on 
a Linux box by default. It wasn't on a Mac, it would have been OS 9, I think, by default. Uh, it wasn't, certainly, still isn't, on Windows by default. Python wasn't anywhere, but Perl was everywhere. Um, and I have to admit, shortly before this, I wrote my one and only production Perl program, and every time I went back to maintain it, I cried. So that, that is my total experience with Perl. I, it was a big deal that we were just a scripting language. Uh, this was the other thing that, that C and Java programmers would tell you if you suggested that people try Python, but it's just a scripting language. Um, what does that mean? Supposedly that meant you couldn't write real programs in it, I guess. I don't know. Uh, so overall, what I recall as being the thing we worried about most is just getting people to try out the language. Um, you know, try it, you'll like it. That used to be an old commercial in the United States. Uh, so uh, that's what, what I remember. Um, that means there were a whole lot of things coming that we had no clue about. Maybe there was somebody there, but I certainly don't recall anybody talking about it. So, so what things were about to happen that we didn't have a clue about? Well, Python 3, and I, and I, I need to qualify this. Uh, starting in the, I don't know, it's 2005 maybe, Guido started talking publicly about what the next version of Python would be. And it was so far in the future that he jokingly called it Python 3000. And that was really our mindset, is that we don't have to worry about any of these things because it's going to be so long before it happens, we'll probably all be retired or something, who knows. Uh, and, you know, it was a list of, well, you know, if we were to do it over again, we would fix this thing, that thing. It was interesting to hear about, but nobody took it very seriously. Uh, and, in fact, while Python has continued, to, Python 3 has continued to be um, adopted regularly and all of that, I think there was no inkling in the community that it would cause some of the angst and, and, and discomfort maybe that, that the adoption of Python 3 has caused. We just have, have had no clue that that was coming. Um, again, in those days, the idea of web frameworks, the idea of something like Django coming along and in effect becoming its own community, nobody would have believed you if in 2002 you would have described the Django community today. Uh, certainly in those days we weren't worried about things like data science. I mean, you know, then you had a few hundred thousand rows of data, you say, oh, that was pretty good. Uh, and, and, of course, things have, have skyrocketed since then. I can recall in 2006, I guess, 2007, uh, I know someone who is a research astronomer, uh, and I tried to persuade him then to try Python for some of his data processing things, and his response was, no, I've got what is it called, ITL, I think it is, or something. There was a proprietary thing that they had, and he's like, I got that, why would I need to try this Python thing? Um, and then I think also the other thing that we were totally clueless about, uh, clueless about, rather, was, was the notion of diversity. I mean, sure, when you went to any Python gathering, pretty much everybody all looked alike and all came from the same background. It, it, was, it was there. Um, certainly, people tried to be nice if you didn't happen to match up exactly, but this was not something that was on our radar at all, the way it is now. Um, I mean, uh, my, my, I don't know if it's favorite, like the most notorious example of missing the point about diversity that I have known of a, in a PyCon is that in the PyCon 2009, which was in Chicago, uh, they actually changed the signs on some of the women's restrooms to make them for men. Okay, now you may think, wow, what's the big deal? Okay, so first of all, we were so predominantly, overwhelmingly just males. And secondly, how did that make that handful of women who suddenly didn't have a restroom to use feel? Nobody even thought of these things. And then, as I say, the other thing that we had no clue about was the fact that PyCon was going to become a thing. Okay, uh, I mean, 
I think some of us would have thought once we started having PyCons, this was pretty cool and we were going to keep on doing it and it would grow. I don't think anybody really understood that this was going to grow sort of around the world the way it has in the past few years. Uh, and, and I've been to a few PyCons in different places and they, they're, they're always, you know, the various variations you get in a different place and a different group of people and that's cool. But the basic idea of a community conference uh, is actually pretty strange. Uh, there aren't many tech communities that do this as well as we do, as much as we do, or enjoy it as much as we do, as far as I can tell. This was something we had no clue about. So, my point with all of this is that the future is a hard thing to predict. Um, I've always joked that I think it would probably be a really cool job to have to be a futurist. Uh, I don't know if anybody claims that title anymore. People used to identify themselves as futurists. And I love that because you can make all these predictions, and by the time it doesn't happen, nobody remembers. So you can go ahead and make more predictions for the future, and again, people won't check on you. Uh, so you can continually deliver these opinions and get away with it. Uh, so, but it, it's hard to predict the future. Um, this is like from the 1920s or something like predicting video conferencing was going to come just around the corner. Uh, and, and I know when I was young in the 60s, we were told that we were going to have picture phones that we would use all the time. Uh, and, and now finally we have video conferencing. Uh, and yet, I think it would shock the people back then to hear that in fact, if we want to actually talk to somebody really quickly, we send them a text rather than, we've got picture phones, why aren't we doing this? So, future is hard, that's my point. Um, in fact, and I'm throwing this in kind of just for the hell of it, um, the flying car thing, we're still waiting on the flying car thing. I want, you, want to point this out. We have been told that we are going to have flying cars any day now for the past 80 years, all right? Um, so, Having admitted that it's hard, having told you that I'm making all of this up, what? What lies ahead? Uh, okay, my first disclaimer is that as a futurist, I am very, very nearsighted, so all of the things I'm talking about are not things that are way out on the horizon. There are things that we're about to run into, if we haven't run into them already. These are things that I think are open questions for Python the language and Python the community. And as I say, if you don't think so, great. Talk to it about somebody. Talk about it to somebody. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the first thing we have to get over is Python 3. Uh, a couple years ago at uh, at PyCon UK, the t-shirt, or no, the, the swag bag said, uh, friends, don't let friends use Python 2. Um, I think that's, that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I have to say this, I, I do some corporate training occasionally, and the last time I did it, and probably the next time I do it, it was in Python 2 because that's what the company used. Uh, a very, very large financial news company based in New York. Uh, and Python 2 is a great language, okay? But it's not as good as Python 3. You know, that, that, that should get some argument from somebody eventually. Um, find me. Um, and, and, you know, we have to move on. All right? Um, you know, I think people would... I, in general, people don't argue that we should continue to drive 1965 Mustangs, even though they're wonderful cars. Uh, we have to move on. Uh, and... It's kind of funny, when I wrote the, my, my latest version of the Quick Python book that's out, I finished in 2010, and it was, you know, the first edition that covered Python 3, and now here we are, seven years later, and this is still a topic for debate. That is something that I did not expect. I mean, I know, there, there are reasons, so on, so on. But we need to get through this because I've got news for you, probably... Right now, we're thinking we'll all be retired, but probably we're going to have to deal with Python 4. Okay? I, it's just, oh, I want things to stay the same. No, we're going to have to move on. Um, 
And in fact, this is the, the Python 3 thing drives me uh, just a little bit mad because um, the adoption and the porting of stuff to Python has been going, Python 3 has been going up in a very remarkably steady curve. It's not as though there's a problem. They predicted it would take a while. It's taking a while, but it's continuing. There is no faltering, no hesitation. And yet, a couple months ago, somebody said, well, you know, I'd like to do Python, but oh, they keep going back and forth. It's so uncertain about the future of the language with two versions and all of that. Um, it's like, no, it isn't really. It's, it's, it's very, very predictable. But in any case, we have to get through this. This isn't even the future, this is now. Um, the GIL, everybody knows what the GIL is? Pretty much the Global Interpreter Lock. There is a talk about it later on today. I, I highly recommend you go, go look at that. Um, of course, Dave Beasley has YouTube videos on it. Larry Hastings has been working on it. Uh, Jesse G. Davis has, has a talk on it uh, for, for, the, for a, a remote thing I'm doing tomorrow. I'm going to be talking about it. The global interpreter lock is the thing that means that if you are doing multiple threads in Python, only one of them can actually write to Python variables at a time. Which in effect means that if you are using CPython and you have a processor intensive thing, you can only use one core. Okay, actually that's not quite true. You can use multiple cores and it will go even slower than if you use one core. And I've demonstrated it. I got that from Dave Beasley. I've demonstrated it, and it is particularly in Python 2, it's shocking how much slower it gets as the multiple threads say, oh, I've got the gill. No, I got the gill. I want the gill. No, you have the gill. It, it just sort of doesn't work. So why is this a big deal? My phone has eight cores. That's my phone. Um, Moore's law, you know, our scaling of performance is no longer going up vertically as in the single processor is getting better. Now we have more and more cores. If Python the language can't take advantage of how the technology is scaling, I personally think this is a problem. Okay, some people have told me, no, no, we'll be fine. We'll just do other things. Uh, and that's possible, I guess, but I, I really think this is something that needs to be dealt with. And the great thing, or the bad thing, however you want to look at it, is there aren't any good answers right now. There are some answers, but none of them are all that good. Uh, so we're working on different solutions for that, but uh, we need a way to do that. I need to wait for CPython to take advantage of multiple cores. Mobile, since I brought up my phone, um, I can run a Python program on my phone. I'm not saying that's impossible, I can do that. What I am saying is that if I want to then take that that program and turn it into an app and put it on the Google Play Store and then the iPhone App Store, I, I know it's theoretically possible, but I don't think I can actually do that in any sort of reasonable amount of time that I have to do that. Nor do I think can anyone, I don't, I haven't even bothered to check, I don't know how tiny the fraction is of things that claim to be Python. Uh, I mean, Kivi has, is a project that's worked on this. Um, beware is trying even more ambitiously to work on this. And I gather that maybe it's for iOS, you can actually now use Beware to create a Python app and put it on the App Store. I think it's possible. Uh, somebody told me they did it, I, I didn't verify this. Uh, so maybe we're starting to get there, but in fact, this is something that we need to think about. Uh, are we going to say no? Python just doesn't do mobile, okay? There are languages that kind of, for one way or another, are in that position. No, we just don't do mobile. Get over it, do something else. Um, is that what we're going to do, or are we going to actually solve that problem and be able to write apps using Python? Uh, I'm not sure I know the right answer in that. I don't have a great opinion on that, but I think that's something that is, is facing us now. 
And those are a couple of technical things. Some of the things that, that occurred to me maybe are a, a bit more involving people. So I think a thing that we're facing now that will only increase and increase dramatically is the fact that our users are diverging. Uh, that is, we used to just all be Pythonistas, or back in the old, old days, Pythoneers, whatever you want to call it. You go to a Python conference and pretty much everybody would go to the same things. Uh, and now there are people that do back-end things, there are people that do Django front-end, there are people that do data science, there are people who do scientific computing, there are people who are using Python for systems work. In other words, we're all over the place, and these groups are increasingly diverging. Um, I mean, I am sort of a back-end and data person. If I were to go to DjangoCon, I don't know what I would go to. No, it's like, okay, I've done a little Django occasionally, but it's no longer, things start to diverge. Um, you know, the data community, PyDatas are, are springing up as their own conference. Um, and I think as we go through time, the, the, the danger is that the people who go to a PyData and the people who go to a DjangoCon, there's going to be increasingly little overlap. Um, that's fine. I'm, I'm not saying we should change that. I'm saying, how do we deal with that and still all be Python people? Or do we? I don't know the answer to that. Diversity. We now know about diversity. Uh, we, do, we don't have the excuse we did years ago of just being ignorant. How do we deal with that? Uh, it's still something that I think we, we work with in terms of gender diversity, but if you add in all of the other dimensions, we now have uh, Python really just sort of taking off in places. There were, I think, in the past year, I think Nigeria had 12 to 14 Django Girls events in different places around Nigeria. That's coming from the previous year of one and the year before that of none. Um, you know, uh, there is a, a large, 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 an incredibly impressive Python community uh, in Latin America, particularly in Brazil, and many of them do not speak English, or at least are not comfortable in English. Uh, I will give them credit, their English is better than my Portuguese, but still, uh, they, you know, how do we handle these things where we now have people in different parts of the world, different cultural traditions, different this, different that, different language? How do we bring all of those people together so that we're all still the same community? Uh, this will only get harder. Um, how do we bring new people into the community? Um, people want to help, but you can't just jump in in a lot of cases and, and do stuff you need to actually be trained, you need to be brought on board. Um, for those of you who are following the PSF board, there's a, we're, we have a, a motion that's being voted on right now to extend board terms. It's not something that I was particularly thrilled with, except for the fact that somebody comes on to a board, it usually takes them six months to figure out how to be a board member properly. Uh, and if you only have a year term, you, you don't have enough time to get things done. So it's this onboarding time. Uh, if you have somebody who's running a conference, they can't just immediately jump into the lead. Well, sometimes maybe, but you know, there are lots of details that you need to know. You can't just instantly pick that up. If you're contributing to a, con to a, a, a project, you usually can't just jump in and make a meaningful contribution without spending a certain amount of time understanding how that project works. What are the assumptions? What are the ways that we approach things? What is our style for formatting code? What's our workflow for getting a pull request in? All of those things take time. So how do we get people in? Because in my opinion, one of the worst things you can do is have people who really, really want to help you and be unable to bring them in because then, then they're just gonna say, okay, well, so they don't want me, and they'll go elsewhere. I don't like that. But the flip side, of course, is that we also have a lot of people who are spending 
honestly, perhaps way too much time doing things for their particular open source project, their particular community, their particular event. All of these things take an enormous amount of time, get too little thanks, and usually no financial uh, compensation. Uh, and these are the people then that we want to spend all of that time I mentioned in the previous slide, bringing on new people. Uh, I have seen, I know of too many good people who have just completely burnt out uh, from doing these things and then have had to step away. That's a tragedy. It is going to get worse as we have more and more. All of these things with increase are going to be pressures that will bring this uh, to be uh, a problem. And, you know, in the larger sense, just if we had a global community of 100 people, that would be dead easy to manage. If we have a global community of 1,000 people, that's fine. We have 10,000 people, that's okay. We have 100,000 people, a million people, this starts to get tricky. Uh, so as we grow, we need to understand how we're going to do that. Um, the PSF needs to understand how we're going to do that. Um, the PSF, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I would like to, uh, and if there's a spot, maybe I'll sign up for a lightning talk, although I don't know I can, what I can do in five minutes, but I, I would like to explain what the PSF does, except that it's kind of hard to explain what the PSF does sometimes. Uh, we're, we're actually trying to figure out a model that goes from being a bunch of people who met every couple weeks to do all of the business that needed to be done to an actual organization where we have ways of managing things that do not involve everybody jumping on a call trying to figure out who gets $100 for a conference or something like that. So, so this is a, something that is at the PSF level as well. Um, we need ways to engage members. We need ways to engage local organizations to build up so that we can actually have a reasonable way of doing these things. We need ways to decide how it is we're going to use our influence, what it is we want to do as a community, and then the PSF as its representative. So all of these are questions that need to be answered. And as I say, one of the goals is we need to do this without losing or without uh, changing too much, without, you know, you kind of fill in the blank there, uh, the sense of community that makes things um, as appealing to all of us as they are. And what have we got to, to put against all of these things? Well, basically it comes down to two things that we have going for us. We've got Python the language, which is still, <coughs> excuse me, is still one of the few languages that really strives towards readability, clarity, and I would say beauty. In fact, I would argue that the reason that Python as a language design has endured so well is the aesthetic and artistic side of it. I have never had the courage to ask Guido if he would agree with that. I, I think he might not agree, but personally, this is my opinion. Uh, it, is the, it is that artistic and aesthetic part uh, beautiful is better than ugly. Uh, that, that, that makes the language something that I think will endure. The other thing we've got is all of us. I am continually, the more I see of the Python community, and the past couple of years I've been fortunate enough to see, see quite a bit of it, uh, I am continually amazed by the energy intelligence and goodwill of all of us. Uh, it, it really is amazing to see the things that people do for this community. So those two things are what we have to face those challenges. Um, this, this saying has, has gotten associated with, with my name some, and I want to be clear that I stole it from Brett. And He's okay with that, in fact. He has, he has sort of given me his, his okay that I can go ahead and share it, but I do always want to appreciate it. Uh, so, you know, in uh, the PyCon 2014, he said, I don't know about the rest of you. I came for the language. I stayed for the community. That, I think, is our best uh, strength, our best way that we will meet these challenges going forward. But here's my futurist thing. I'm going to go out on a limb here. We're going to have flying cars, but they're going to have Python inside. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, what programming language do you see as a main threat to Python in the near future? Maybe Julia. Um, I, I honestly don't think Julia, not that it isn't a cool language. Um, I mean, I think that um, the current competition is JavaScript. And JavaScript makes me queasy in a number of ways. Um, I, I occasionally will, will publish tweets when people find the things where you can do like equality comparisons in Java and get three different uh, JavaScript rather and get three different answers for what seems like the same question. Um, so, but that is the language that has the most mind share. I, I don't think we want to look for. I, I think we want to look for where things are in the market, and that's the that's the thing that is everywhere my opinion. Thank you. Uh, what are your views on the marriage between Python and deep learning and AI? Uh, for example, designing neural networks. How do you foresee the future of artificial intelligence and Python? Um, this is something that, you know, is... I, I think if all of my talk was uninformed, then this is going to be even more uninformed. Uh, no, I've played with TensorFlow and things like that. I think that, uh, in general, the, the combination of Python and various forms of AI will continue to grow. I think that that is a growth area for us, quite definitely. Why do you think it's growth? Hmm? Why will it grow? Yeah, why? Why? Um, because we are becoming increasingly strong in the areas of data science generally. So people will tend to use, in my opinion, a lot of the tools that they're familiar with, and we are becoming the tools that, you know, Python is becoming a key part of the tool set that deals with slicing and dicing and doing various things with data, for one thing. Uh, for another thing, I think it's because it's so much easier to put together things. Um, you know, it's Python has always had a strength as kind of a glue language. There may be pieces that need to be optimized and done in some other language, but for somebody who is not a specialist developer, and even for somebody who is, but they want to move fast, we're still a good choice. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, do you think AI can p produce better code than humans in the near future? I think this, man, this means artificial intelligence again. Yeah, I would guess so. Um, I'm, I'm old, and I've seen this promised several times before, and it's never panned out. So, um, so, you know, Again, taking advantage of the whole futurist thing that you're not going to remember and remind me about this in 10 years. My bet is that we will not have AI code generators that do meaningful coding better than humans in the next five to 10 years. I doubt it. Okay. Uh, you mentioned Python 4. Are there any plans for Python 4? Um, I, there, there is, there, I think there's sort of starting to be discussion about Python 4. Um, I haven't been part of those discussions at this point, so I can't even guess. But um, yeah, there, there's starting to be discussions of that. I don't think it's any great secret. I think if you sort of look around, uh, I believe maybe somebody has, has even given a, some sort of informal talk or something on this subject. So don't worry, it'll be so far in the future we'll all be retired. Right. Right, I'll skip the obvious troll, <laughs> I think. Or do you have a comment on that? On, on that one? Uh, the uh, Python 2.6 waiting for Python 4? Just keep waiting. <laughs> uh, what do you think about the growing Golang community? Um, 
I, I'm, I have not actually done anything in Go, so I don't have a, much of an educated opinion. Um, it, it does seem to be growing in kind of uh, system type ways, but you know, in terms of a, of a community and where the language is going, um, it bears watching, but I really don't have enough knowledge to comment beyond that. And the last, not really a question, uh, you can actually almost buy a flying car today. One is being certified in Slovakia, and it's not a good plane, and one here in the Czech Republic, right. <laughs> it's not a good car. <laughs> okay, I, there you go, see? And it will have Python inside, I promise you. <laughs> All right, uh, any more questions from the audience? Last chance? All right, thank you, Naomi. Thank you.